Hello, saints. Peace, love, grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Hope everyone is doing fantastic today. Today we're moving into Acts chapter 7 of our study on the entire book of Acts, chapter by chapter. Quick review of what we've seen thus far in our study. What we've seen is the ascension of our Lord Jesus, the creation of the little flock, believing Jews under the 12 apostles, and don't let the name little flock fool you. There's tens of thousands of Jewish believers in the kingdom gospel during this time period that we're looking at. This little flock is literally thinking that they're in the last days. And technically, they are in the last days. They're expecting the Antichrist to come to power at any point. The 12 apostles have been given miraculous powers by the Holy Spirit to enable them with the ability to speak in many languages, heal the sick, perform signs and wonders all throughout Jerusalem. We talked about why this power has been given to the apostles. Then in the last study, we were introduced to the prophet Stephen. Now Luke writes that Stephen was full of faith and power, doing great wonders and miracles among the people. And we saw how the Jewish priesthood was confounded and perplexed by the words coming out of Stephen's mouth. They weren't able to answer Stephen's questions. They couldn't challenge the authority that Stephen spoke with. And we see the reason why in Luke 21. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. Now look at this next verse. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. The Holy Spirit was speaking directly through prophet Stephen and he was confounding even the wise libertines they were perplexed at the wisdom coming from Stephen's mouth because it was God speaking through Stephen and at this point in our study one thing that should stand out to you in your mind is who's preaching what they're preaching and why they're preaching it the gospel that they're spreading throughout the entire region so far, we've been talking about Peter and the other 11 apostles preaching the apostles' doctrine, the gospel of the kingdom. Repent, be baptized, and continue performing to the end. Some wise virgins and some not-so-wise virgins, some having fruit of their faith and works, others not so much. The same gospel that Jesus preached when he was walking with the apostles in the earthly ministry. In Matthew 4, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. In Mark 1, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel in Acts 2 then Peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And we discuss what remission is compared to forgiveness of sins. One is temporary, and the other is complete. In this next verse, Jesus is talking about Daniel's 70th week, leading up to his return, having the kingdom of heaven with him, ushering in the promises to the twelve tribes in Matthew 24 but he that shall endure unto the end 
You see that? Endure unto the end. That's a works-based program. The kingdom gospel, the same shall be saved. Only they that endure until the end will be saved when they call on the name of the Lord. The Lord will come and save them. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, what I want you to realize is the difference between the gospel of the kingdom versus the gospel of grace that Paul is going to preach later on in our study. There's a very distinct difference between the kingdom gospel and the gospel of grace. One is faith plus works, enduring to the end. The other is faith alone, believing on Jesus Christ in truth and sincerity for total salvation. Believing on Jesus Christ means you're believing on Him in whole, in truth, on His death, burial, and resurrection. That's believing on Him. They, in the kingdom gospel, believed in Jesus as the person being the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, we've just gone over some examples of the gospel that Jesus and the apostles preached during that administration or that dispensation, if you will. Now, let's look at what Paul preaches and notice the difference here. And also notice that Paul's gospel was kept secret from the world until after Israel's fall, after the diminishing of the kingdom gospel, after they kill their prophet Stephen in Acts 20. But none of these things move me. This is Paul. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Romans 2 In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Paul's gospel. Not the kingdom gospel. Paul's gospel. Romans 16 Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Second Timothy 2 Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. This is Paul again. Again, First Timothy 1, Paul is speaking according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Galatians 1. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Now, how could Paul say such a thing if he had received the gospel from Peter or the other 11 apostles? Paul couldn't have said such a thing. He could not have said that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ revealed this mystery, secret gospel to Paul and Paul alone. Colossians 1 Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Ephesians 2 For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you see the distinction here? A difference between the kingdom gospel that preaches, repent, be baptized, and endure unto the end. Keep working your salvation unto the end, until the second coming, when they call on the name of the Lord and he saves them, is very different than what Paul just says here. He says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. I mean, that's pretty plain and simple, lest any man should boast. In Romans 10, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Romans 6, Paul again, for sin, sh for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And there's dozens and dozens of more Pauline scriptures that seemingly, seemingly conflict with the works and door till the end doctrine of the kingdom gospel. A seeming contradiction. And you see the difference in gospels by comparing Paul's books and the last day's books of Hebrews through Revelation. A couple days ago, some of you read the book of James and you saw the kingdom gospel works and James wrote faith is not faith without works without works you can't have faith but Paul says faith is faith alone without works you see there's two different gospels being taught because there's two different time periods two different groups of people for two totally separate situations and I say seeming contradictions because without rightly dividing, it seems that there's a scripture contradiction. But when you rightly divide, it's obvious that one scripture is written to a certain group of people in a certain time period under a certain dispensation of that gospel. And other scriptures are, is written to and for a different group in a different dispensation of the gospel. So with right division, there is no contradiction, only logical progression of God's plan for mankind. So why this secret? Why does God turn to the Gentiles and reveal a new mystery gospel? Well, God tells us why in Romans. Romans 11, written by Paul, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. In Romans 11, and David saith, let their table be made a snare, speaking of Israel, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy, now, if the fall of them be the riches of this world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. Through turning to the Gentiles, Israel will become jealous that their God has now left them in the dust. And we're going to learn later in our Acts study that God gave Paul certain gifts and powers early in the transition period. Now, to further make the Jews jealous, Paul spoke in tongues. He baptizes. He heals Gentiles. The power that only the Jews had at one time has now gone to the Gentiles through the Apostle Paul. This was all to increase Israel's jealousy and to provoke them into believing. But when the transition is over, the transfer from the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of grace by Paul, we see these powers and these gifts fade away as well. This was all part of the plan during the transition period. And keep in mind that this transition didn't happen overnight it took a, it took place over 30 plus years that's why we see an overlap of gospels in a small window of time it was necessary to fulfill god's plan 
And it's not confusing at all if you keep in mind that there's a transfer from one dispensation to another during this time period. Again, right division is key here. A simple way to explain this window of time where Peter's gospel of the kingdom is dominant and Paul's gospel of grace is just starting out. If you look at the chart that's on the screen, you see the green line at the top left. This is Peter's gospel of the kingdom. The orange line at the bottom is Paul's gospel of grace. If moving from left to right is the number of years or time, if you will. As we progress over the remaining years in Acts, from left to right, the kingdom gospel declines and Paul's gospel increases. And as they get closer together, meeting in the middle, is a small window of time where you're, you'll see an apparent mixing of both gospels. Now, what do I mean by that? In this small window, you'll see Paul speaking in tongues, healing the sick, baptizing some Jews. There's a short period of time the two Gospels were happening simultaneously. But as we move further in time towards the right, Peter's Kingdom Gospel continues to decline and Paul's Gospel of Grace continues to increase. And what that does is starts to separate the two Gospels. Also, it begins to reduce Paul's abilities in tongues, in healing, and he stops baptizing altogether. And finally, at the end of the 30 years or so, Paul's gifts have come to a complete stop, and Peter's kingdom gospel comes to an end, or a pause for 2,000 years. So, we can see why Paul was at, at first he was healing, performing signs and wonders and so on, but that all ends with the end of the kingdom gospel. Like I said, it pauses completely for 2,000 years and it's going to start up again after the rapture takes place. Now, moving on in chapter 7, God is still speaking through Stephen here. God is reminding the Jews who they are, where they came from, why they had so many problems in the past, and what they need to do in the future to be reconciled to their Lord God. Acts chapter 7 verse 1, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers. This is Stephen speaking. Actually, God is speaking through Stephen. The Holy Spirit is speaking through Stephen right now. Hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charon, and from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land, wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years, the strange land here being Egypt. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Judged by God, is he poured out those ten plagues over Egypt. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs being the twelve sons of Jacob, each one being one of the twelve tribes of Israel. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him, and delivered him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of, the, of Pharaoh king of Egypt. 
and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now, there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction. And our fathers found no substance. They had no food. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren. And Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. Threescore is sixty and fifteen would come to seventy-five people. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Sychem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sychem. Sychem. But when the time of the promised Junai, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months and when he was cast out Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defeated him, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at once again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me, as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at the saying, and was a stranger in the land of Madian, where he begat two sons. <coughs> Excuse me. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out. After that, he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt saying unto Aaron make us gods to go before us for as for this Moses 
which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. And it was written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrificed by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Molech, and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Now most of us have heard about Molech, another fallen angel who demanded children sacrifice. The Israelites would offer their children to Molech by placing the child on his hands while being burned alive. The worship of Molech is still very much alive today. Now who is Remphan? Most likely another fallen angel, one of the hosts of heaven. What's rather interesting is the star of Remphan. I bet most of you have never realized what this star looks like. I'm not going to tell you what it looks like. Go ahead and Google images for the star of Remphan. You'll be rather surprised. It's spelled R-E-M-P-H-A-N. And I was surprised. And it actually all makes sense in the bigger scheme of things. Verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. As he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Which also our fathers that came after brought it in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist a holy ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of all, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one and whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said behold I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God notice here Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father he's not sitting he's standing and that's very significant depending on what they Israel does to Stephen determines whether or not Daniel's 70th week begins immediately and Israel is judged. In order to fully understand this, you have to realize that the Father limited, at that time, Jesus' knowledge of the future. For that moment, and that's a whole study in itself, which we will get into later on. Now, Jesus is standing and not sitting, is what's important to keep in mind here. The day of the Lord was ready to commence. Jesus was at the ready. He was standing. But what happens? We read on. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, 
Lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. They kill their one and only chance to usher in the kingdom of heaven on earth. They killed them. So at this point, I believe the father reveals this secret of the body of Christ to the son Jesus. Remember, the secret was hid in the father, not the son. Only God the father knew this secret. Because Israel rejected the Holy Spirit by stoning Stephen, they also rejected the coming of Jesus Christ, their promised earthly kingdom. And notice who's participating in Stephen's death here. It's Saul. Before his conversion, before he's an apostle, prior to the secret being revealed, before the body of Christ is created. And that's all about to come soon. In closing, as we move into chapter 8 in our study, we're about to see this secret hidden in God finally revealed. And he picks Saul, a Jew born in Gentile territory, a Hebrew of Hebrews, someone who's going to play a very important role in the near future, and he also plays a very important role in our lives today. So with that, peace, grace, love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you in the next study in chapter 8 on the book of Acts. Thank you.